This is going to be a small presentation. I'll try to keep it at 20 minutes. Um, this is a view from the trenches, so to say, um, about our local RDM efforts. Um, I've been asked specifically to also uh, talk a little bit about the situation in the Netherlands to give you a national perspective as possibly an interesting contrast with the UK or, other, or your local situation. Um, and I'll try to talk fast. I have no problems with that. If I'm unclear, if you have any urgent question, I'm fine to be interrupted, please, by all means. Um, I'm fine with that, even though the main discussion will be afterwards. But do interrupt me, please. Um, this roadmap of the presentation, um, a little bit about the context in which this RDM program takes place um, and the, the Dutch national context. Um, then I'll dive into our program, into the nitty gritty, which is halfway, so it's going to be a halfway uh, lessons learned, but we're not quite there yet. But hopefully it'll be interesting because it'll hopefully also give some trends and roles and the perspective from the library, some food for thought for later discussion. Um, the Dutch academic landscape is different from the UK and different from, well, it, it differs from most countries in the terms that it's very, uh, this is the polder, um, it's, it's, it's very homogenic, it's very bland. Um, of a population of 60 million, there's 14 research universities, um, quarter million students, 25k researchers. Um, the GERD, um, I wrote down what it means, the gross the domestic expenditure on research and development, an e important economic indicator that uh, indicates how much of the GDP is actually spent on R&D is the EU average at 2%. Germany has three, the Scandinavian countries are four to four and a half. So it's not that we're a very into R&D uh, country, although people, uh, our prime minister would like to say it differently. Um, and the last thing to, uh, to keep in mind when I'm talking about the Dutch situation is if you omit the two outliers, which are the ones on the left and the right, um, the largest university is, has about two and a half times the number of researchers as the smallest, so to say. And the smallest one, I mean the very small one is the Open University, which is a special case. And the very large one is a dedicated research, a technical university, which also is a special case. But so it's a very homogenic landscape, which means that there is competition, but um, we're all quite level with each other. Um, I've been asked specifically to give a little bit of context also about the nationwide institutions, which role they're playing, and it's, frankly speaking, it's a huge mess and everybody's still assessing. So this is confusing by intent. Um, we have, these are the VSNU, KNAW, NDO. Um, first one is, let me just give you proper English names. First one is the Association of Universities in the Library uh, in, in the Netherlands. So it's a university, it's a kind of a lobbying uh, thing and they set up the evaluation standards, for instance. A lot of policy coming out of that. Um, the second one is the Royal Academy of Science, um, which sets policy, which actually um, sets the guidelines for compliance that a researcher should adhere to. So it's also a bit like a professional body. However, they're also involved in funding, and they also have a number of re dedicated research institutions. So it's already blending theory and practice, so to say. Um, and the NWO is the main funding body, which also confusingly has a number of dedicated institutions. Um, but in their funding, they are, can actually play an important role in setting the guidelines, for instance, for open access compliance of results or research data, right? They influence the policy, they influence the RDM landscape. And the three um, even worse um, uh, jargon, uh, how do you say that? Uh, the three words behind it are actually dedicated semi-private, uh, no, se um, dedicated funding agencies for specific fields, which actually funnel money from NWO, but they can set their own standards. Specifically, the first one is for the health sciences. They're actually the, by far the most forward-looking and progressive in um, demanding access to research data for published research. So it's, this is uh, the first part, the policy part. It's already confusing with four. Then we have SURF. SURF is, um, to those who know the UK situation, SURF is much akin to JISC, um, meaning that they have an innovation, but they've also got a department which runs the Dutch national internet backbone for the academia. Um, they also have SURF market, which does a lot of like uh, negotiations for licensing. Um, so they're quite an important um, infrastructure provider. Um, in the past, they used to be very active with you know, uh, innovation, uh, fostering projects, which also, as a rule, like JISC projects, would have to be several universities cooperating. And unfortunately, the funding has dried up. Um, so that's a rather nasty situation we're dealing with at the moment. But it's still, the effects of that still echo on. 
Finally, specifically for the RDM landscape, we have DANCE and also the 3TU data center, which together form the RDNL alliance, um, which are both their institutes, uh, DANCE is dealing with humanities and uh, the social sciences, the 3TUs have, uh, are the three technical universities which set up their dedicated data center. Um, and then they more or less decided that that should be the counterpart of DANCE for the, uh, the beta sciences. Um, it's all in flux. This is all nice, but which roles each of these institutions is taking, um, they're all very much wayfinding. So you can't really deny it. It's not that we can build on any of these. They don't know themselves. So a little bit about our own program. I'm pressed for time, so I'll run through it short. Um, we have, uh, we've talked about silos a lot yesterday. I want to uh, come up with a different silo, uh, namely Andrew Talor's silo model. This is one of the three pillars that we've built our RDM effort on. You're probably familiar with it. I'll just run through it quickly for those who aren't. Um, Andrew Talor, in an influential 2007 article, um, stated that as libraries, we've, off, we've traditionally focused on the public part, the final outcome of research. That's what our institutional repositories are for. Um, for publications, it kind of is a logical thing. But for data, it doesn't work, because if we're only focusing on the endpoint, we're not capturing whatever is happening in the periods before. And, um, he's using the, models, uh, the model of three silos, um, namely silos which each have their own tools, uh, but which also, to go from one silo to the next one, is a huge phase change. There's a lot of effort and energy that the researcher has to do to actually move whichever part of the research uh, cycle it is from one silo to the other. So what are we to do if we are a library? Uh, our ultimate goal is to capture at least this public. That's our original mandate, right? Even though hopefully that mandate will shift, but assume that we just come from the repository corner. We also want to have, we want to fill our data repositories to make sure the data is reused. Well, for that, we have, inevitably, we have to focus on providing services for both these three silos. Because if a researcher in his uh, own private working environment or in the environment in which a researcher works together with a group, where the tools are, where the collaboration happens, where ideas form, um, it'll be, if we aren't in that position, if we aren't providing tools there, we're not going to capture it. And it's huge to then ask suddenly at the time of publication or at the time of the end of a research project, come, please come and send me all the relevant data. Well, we've seen, uh, for those who were here yesterday, it's actually not just a simple file. It's actually a whole complex. The software needs to be there, the whole context, the metadata, there's lots of things. We need to be in the whole cycle. So this is vital that we take all these three silos and that we take into consideration to make it as easy as possible to transfer from one of these silos to the other, make them less silos and lower the barriers, right? Um, number two is the happy researcher. This is my favorite researcher. Um, at this researcher, this research is bombarded from three directions in most RDM programs. There's policy coming from above. There's support being offered from somewhere down, and there's also an infrastructure to do all this. Um, we started out our RDM effort last year, and before that we looked at a number of RDM projects, and we found that if you don't orchestrate these three tightly, you'll fail. Uh, you can't um, roll out a policy without the infrastructure uh, to comply with it. Um, if, if support's failing, researchers still don't know what to do, and if you do it without a policy, um, they won't feel obliged to actually use any of the services or infrastructure that we're proudly to giving. So we need to unify this, this is vital. And we also need to unify this for all these stages. This is our framework. Um, this actually means that it's not just a library. There's, in, in our case, there's are three supporting institutions as part of the university which need to work together because they're all three stakeholders. And um, John just talked about who's doing what, be very clear about who's uh, the lead for which part. Well, academic affairs has to lead together with the faculties uh, the efforts for policy. Um, ICT service is the natural partner for at least the main grind of the ICT services, especially those during the research. I mean, we're a library, we're not an ICT department. Um, however, library is also there because traditionally with repositories, we know what we are much more uh, first to uh, questions of durability, preservation, long-term reuse. The ICT department is actually not very well versed into issues like that. And finally, support is very clearly the library. 
So these are our guiding principles, and the last one is don't reinvent the wheel, because please, I'm going to talk about projects. All of these projects are, we're piloting, we're doing services, but if there's a market partner that comes up and does a good offer, makes a better service, a cloud service, whatever be it, absolutely we'll buy it. We, we don't want to uh, do a roll it all ourselves. So our goals, um, at the end of next year, this is what we'd like to have together. We want to have a policy on an institutional and faculty level, meaning at the moment we don't have it yet. Uh, we, we tried it already once and it failed. It's an ongoing effort. Um, in technology, we want to have services for all these three silos. We want to have services for during the research. We want to have services for archiving, citing, publishing your data. Um, needs to be all there. And for support, we really want to have a, one, a full one-stop shop. A researcher with any question about research data management, whether it be about implementing policy, whether about uh, publishing data, finding the right journal, um, about rights, um, but also about technology, should just have one place to go to. That's our aim. And we're at the moment getting our support structure together, and that's, I'm actually surprised that's maybe the best, the, the part of the program that's running the best at the moment. So to do this, we're implementing a number of projects. Um, I think uh, to also hint back to John, like you, at the beginning of this process, we try to find the right administrative structure to get this together, to find the right mandate within the context at that time of the politics of our institution. Um, so it was deemed best to uh, set up a number of different projects under the umbrella of the program. A dedicated pro uh, project for policy, a dedicated one for support, and three for the technology because the technology is just too big. The storage during research, just for practical reasons, we cut it up and we first are doing a pilot. Because after the, only after the pilot we'll have an idea of the kind of budget, of the kind of ambition, not just that we want, but also that politically is viable, right? So it was deemed, let's just do a pilot first in 2015, we'll do the big rollout. Um, also the repository, we've separated the repository from the storage during research. Not because we would like there to be a big barrier, but in between them, on the contrary, we would like to be as seamless as possible. But these are different stakeholders that are running it. Um, politically, this was the best way to do it. As it turns out, it might actually be that the storage during research project is going to deliver a project which might also be our repository. Win. And the most important part of all, we're not doing it alone. We can't do it alone. We should not do it alone. So we have eight pilot groups of researchers, research, actually proper research groups from four faculties that we're working with together. They all participate in the full program, so each of these projects can draw on these researchers, initially to ask them for feedback, to come back to them, ask them, these are our plans, what do you think of it? Also, we started out by evaluating which are your current, uh, the problems you're running into right now. Um, we want to be really practical so we can come to them for feedback. Uh, we have other feedback mechanisms as well, but this is really vital. Um, and there might be some changes in these groups. Some of the groups might actually stop their participating. In that case, we're going to find new ones. So where in all this is the role of the library? Because it's all an orchestrated effort. Well, when we're dealing with policy, uh, we're not the lead. But what we can do is assist, and we can help to actually lobby. Um, and in our case, in our university, the League of European uh, Research Universities actually turned out to be a big player in convincing uh, our faculty, our rector, um, and the highest management. That's good. Um, there's also the UKB. This is a national uh, uh, association of uh, research universities. So we're kind of assisting. We're pushing in there. We know we're not the lead. We shouldn't try to. Second thing in the technology, again, assist and lobby, make sure that the ICT department has the right ideas, try to influence them, we're actively participating in them, um, and we actually lead in our repository efforts. Finally, but the big opportunity is in support. We have all these faculty liaisons, we should use them. They are uh, the closest any of the supporting institutions has to, I, uh, to if feet on the ground. Um, and it turns out what our researchers want. There's a lot of questions about metadata. Well, we actually have that leverage. We should really use it. Here's our big chance. Um, it's about publication, citation, about reuse, and you can't do that without. Um, so the roles are shifting. This is Since we started this project a year ago, um, there's many more service providers at the moment. Let me just, I don't trust anything but paper sometimes. Right? 
where you see that I don't forget a vitally important thing. Right, there's a number of things. There's uh, uh, stuff coming from the EU debt project. Um, Surf is now coming up with a service called Surf Drive, which is built as a Dropbox for repositories, uh, Dropbox for researchers, sorry. Um, there's uh, the EU.demo. Uh, Dense is now actually hosting Dataverse as a national uh, institution. Um, fake share is becoming active in the market. Very interesting. Um, the front and back office model is uh, the research data in Netherlands is uh, pushing that for it quickly. Um, which is also some universities are jumping at the chance to really outsource their whole, uh, not just their back office, but also part of their front office. Um, and finally, we don't have legislation in place yet, but there's all these institutions I, uh, that were, I quoted on this messy slide. They're all moving. They're all moving. There's, we can count on something happening. So, as I said, we're halfway, some lessons so far. The most important thing to take home is like this couldn't have happened without fostering collaboration between all these supporting institutions at our university. We have academic services, we have the ICT department. They used to be very independent agents. We had hardly any contact with them at all. And this RDM effort is actually right now, it's, it's torn down the walls that were there. This is actually a very good side effect. Um, by having the directors of these three departments in the, project, in the program board, we actually have to support a board. This also makes the chance of success when we're lobbying at the highest level at the university. By have, we're also orchestrating our lobbying efforts. It's very, very important, but it works both ways. Um, and you can't do it without it. It's, there are so many sides to this thing. It's a library. You can't go it alone. Storage is very boring, however it's necessary because it's the first thing researchers are clamoring for and we want to do things with metadata, we want to do citation and publishing, we want to think about long-term preservation, we want to think about the viability of um, research that has, come, has become digital, we want to capture all that, you need the storage for that, it just needs to be in place. Um, Finally, the market is developing very rapidly. We would like to buy it. Once there are cloud providers or software as a service providers that can do it within what we find legally acceptable, for instance, uh, cloud providers within EU jurisdiction will be an important part. There's also other um, reasons for um, selecting our partners. Um, and we'd love to, and maybe in a year this will be there. It will, it, it's, things are actually looking a lot more up than they used to. So. Finally, um, the one thing we should not be is wary. We should not be too cautious. Because a year ago, we really didn't know how much of this was feasible. There's actually a lot more accomplished than what I already was hoping for and what we're aiming for. That's good. Um, got to take risks. We got to be uh, willing to fail. Got to be willing to try things and change things halfway. For instance, this market situation, we want to really make sure um, we can agree. We, by doing this, when the market develops, we'll actually know what to look for in a buy and when we're going to buy. So I do believe I'm in time. Very good. <laughs> so a big thank you to all these lovely, creative, uh, common people uh, who are doing it all for the greater good. And a big thank you for you for listening.